everybody. Welcome back. We're here. It's another edition of Lunch Hour Live here at WGBH. Not at the Boston Public Library this time. We're actually in my house in Roxbury. Uh, so um, it's garbage day. So the trucks will be outside. The dogs might bark. The birds might tweet. So if you could just bear with us as we bring you a very special edition of Lunch Hour Live and urging you, of course, to participate because I know you're home watching. What else are you doing? So you can just leave your comments or questions with us here on the social media broadcast. We're so happy to bring something I think that's going to be both nourishing and intellectually stimulating and, and make you have some feelings, which should be a good thing right about now. We're going to speak with Elisa New. Elisa is the host of Poetry in America, which is a great half hour program, which is going to start up again soon in April. Uh, entering its second season. Elisa, you know, I got to tell you, I know some people, they hear poetry and they think, ugh, but this is not, ugh, this is stimulating and exciting and bringing such a great panel of people from everywhere, all walks of life, to get together to talk about poetry, right? Who, who's on deck this year to talk about the, the poems that they love? Oh, we have wonderful guests, and thank you so much, Sue, for um, for having me on the show. Um, we have uh, Katie Couric and John Kerry and Bill T. Jones, and um, we have uh, Raul Esparza, the um, really famous Broadway uh, Broadway singer, along with Melissa Errico. We have. Um, uh, Justice Elena Kagan, we have playwright Tony Kushner, um, we have, who else do we have? We have all, we have all sorts of people you, you know um, from American life, and we also have um, ordinary readers um, of all kinds who um, bring their hearts and their curiosity to exploring in this series one poem per episode. And, and they're American poems. You're focusing on the, the American poetry experience and everything that that has to offer, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And that means that in this season, for instance, we go from a poem that takes you under the oceans uh, to a poem that takes you to the streets of New York City uh, to a poem that takes you into what it feels to sit in a barber chair and to have your memory um, uh, carry you away to a poem that is set on the Broadway stage. Um, poetry does scare people and they are daunted by it and they have traumatic memories of <laughs> from uh, uh, from grammar school and they it, somehow it makes them feel inadequate. But in fact, um, poetry is language that speaks to us as human beings. And um, I, I'm, I'm so glad that the first season of the show began to gather enough of the community enthusiastic about, um, about reading and experiencing poems that we, you know, we're now back for a second season. Uh, and airing soon. All right, let's take a look. We're going to set up a, a clip, just sort of a, a look forward into what this season has to bring. We're talking with Elisa New. She is the host of Poetry in America, which is going to start its second season uh, pretty soon here in April. Let's take a look at a clip of, the, of what we can expect this season. This season of Poetry in America takes viewers from the depths of the ocean to the hills of Vietnam, from Walt Whitman's New York to Silicon Valley. Hong Kong, San Francisco, San Jose. Is this a poem about urban lovers? It's about the self representing something larger. I read this poem to my poetry circle. People wept. Sondheim was able to create a poem that brings to life that sublime sensation of being lost in creativity. The art of losing isn't hard to master. 
This poem is One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. It's a poem clearly about loss with the most intense and profound feelings that you can have as a human being. The poem has ripped open something for me. Can you allow yourself to fall in love again? Reading this made me think a little bit harder about what I was seeing every day. The title of this poem is really important. You and I are disappearing. We're disappearing. How do you take the nightmares and dreams and put them on to paper? What he wrote is based on experience. And anybody that reads it, if they have a compassionate heart, it becomes alive. That's a little taste of Poetry in America, the second season, which here in the Boston area will start on this Sunday night on WGBH. And you can actually watch it all across the country and urging you to go to the website, uh, poetryinamerica.org uh, to, to look at last season. Um, I'm speaking with Elisa New, who's the host of Poetry in America. I mean, I'm so struck about the visual images and um, the, the, the tapestry that you're able to weave around these discussions. It's not just for people who might be notable sitting in a chair talking <laughs> about poetry uh, and their feelings. It's also you painting a landscape of how these, these, these words can be experienced by each of the participants. You know, um, that is something that I, I love doing. Um, it's a, a um, incredibly rewarding kind of work to think about how to coordinate and synchronize imagery and music and to use all of the resources of the video uh, in order to offer exposition of these poems. But, you know, people used to um, read poetry in a more dimensional and full-bodied way. Poetry was not always just read in the solitude of your cold room on the cold page by your lonesome. In the middle of the 19th century in America, people um, would gather around the fire and read poetry to each other by the hour. Uh, kids would recite poetry uh, in classrooms. And of course, poetry has always been part of theater and of the pageantry um, of uh, national life and experience. And so I see what I'm doing in some ways as just recapturing the, um, the ways in which we, we uh, as a civilization, have used poetry over time. I want to urge folks watching us on Facebook and on Twitter that if you have comments or questions, uh, for Elisa, let us know. Just put them in the comments um, box. We actually have one right now. I'm going to give to you, Elisa. Um, what's your favorite poem? I know that's sort of like, what's your favorite? Who's your favorite kid? But uh, is there a poem or uh, a poet uh, that that has really impacted you or stuck with you or or it really just is flat out your favorite? It really is um, a, a, like asking me about my favorite kid because I do go to different poems for different reasons and I keep little pieces of lots of poems with me. But I would say the poet I find most inexhaustible is Emily Dickinson, uh, whom, uh, you know, stanzas of whose work I, I have, uh, I know by I know by heart, and who's one of those poets uh, who you know Emily Dickinson wrote seventeen hundred poems uh, in her in her lifetime. I will never get to the end of all of them, and so her her largeness is very important uh, to me. But but I love um, I love encountering new poems. Uh, and new poets, and one of uh, one of the things I love about making this series is having uh, my guests, my co-interpreters, really teach me uh, how to understand uh, poems and the cultures from which they come and which they reflect on. To give just a teeny example of that, uh, the first episode in the series uh, in uh, season two is a poem called Urban Love Poem. 
that is a, a, a poem that really tells the whole history of San Francisco from the gold rush uh, to Silicon Valley. And the interpreters we bring uh, to, to reflect on that episode just know more <laughs> than I do <laughs> about San Francisco, about their family's history in San Francisco. And so the, the, my expertise only goes so far. Um, and, and I, so I, I, I love that. So let's take a look at another clip and I, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback off of what you're talking about with this clip. This is a, a real who's who list of folks from all walks of life uh, talking about Elizabeth Bishop and her poem. So let's take a look at this clip from Poetry in America, which uh, the second season debuts this Sunday. Let's take a look. This poem is One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster. Places and names, and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Elizabeth Bishop is now cherished as one of the greatest American poets of the 20th century. Her poem, One Art, is regarded as her masterpiece and a modern classic. To explore the poem, I gathered six extraordinary readers. I'm so happy to be sitting here with Katie Couric, who has kindly agreed to discuss Elizabeth Bishop's One Art with me. It's a poem clearly about loss, but loss on several levels. And it touches me because I am a completely disorganized mess and I lose things constantly. And because I have uh, dealt with uh, tragic loss in my life. You can't master loss. There's no one I know who's been through tragic loss that thinks they could control it. In my own experience, I certainly couldn't. Mastery means finding a way, finding a way to feel pain without it threatening you or overwhelming you. These instructions about how to navigate the world, how to navigate your grief, those are things you talk about, you think about, you wonder about, you practice when you're older. What we're looking at with Bishop is a true poet. That is to say, there's enormous amount of chaos and confusion inside them. In that way, they resemble human beings. But what poets do is they turn that confusion, experience, and crisis, they turn it into language. Elisa, I don't know if we could have picked a more appropriate segment to showcase today as we're, we're sort of in this crisis all together with uh, each of us in uh, many different yet the same ways being just awash with loss and grief over what's happening in the world right now at this moment. Um, is, yes. And, and, and this, of course, you know, I think we all have uh, tragic loss in our lives, but rarely does our tragic loss have to be so publicly pro public as it was for Katie Couric and, and Cheryl Sandberg in the loss of their spouses uh, that became uh, headline news for a long time. How, how did the reading of, and the choice of this poem by Elizabeth Bishop and the gathering of the folks that you brought, the readers, how did that come about? 
that is one of, um, for me, uh, the most rewarding things about about doing this show. In this case, um, Katie Couric um, uh, chose the poem. I invited her to read a poem with me. And this was in fact, before I knew there would be a television series, I was creating educational content that um, I distributed in, through various platforms. And so I asked Katie if she would read a poem with me and she said, yes, um, and the poem should be one art. Um, on that foundation, when I realized that this would be a television episode, I began to think about who, uh, who, whom to ask. And uh, Greg, Gregory Orr, who uh, is a poet who experienced very tragic loss in his own life, um, was one I wanted to ask. Um, I asked Sheryl Sandberg, not, not at all sure that she would um, be willing to talk about this poem, but um, of course she lost her her husband Dave Goldberg uh, very tragically when he was very young, and she she was she said, "Oh, I I understand that poem, and yes, I will discuss it with you." I thought it would be good to have a psychiatrist <laughs> on hand because this poem it cannot be read simply as a case study of our suffering and our denial and the stages of grief, it can't be read that way, but some psychological insight seemed to me um, essential. I was so lucky um, that Mary, Ch the extraordinary Mary Chapin Carpenter, whose music I'm, uh, you know, a huge fan of, uh, was actually visiting uh, and giving a concert in, uh, in, in Truro where I have a summer house and I reached out to her and said, could we, could we film together on a poem? And here's one I have in mind uh, for you. And she in fact came to my house with her guitar, um, does the music for, uh, for the episode. Um, and we also have the um, internationally famous Yang Lan, who is some people would uh, she in China they call her the Opera of China. <laughs> um, and this ensemble cast um, came uh, came together. And of course, I film all of these interviews separately. Um, I I sometimes learn from what one guest says new things about the poem that I'm then able to ask others. But in the, in the case of this, in the case of this show, um, it, we do have the experience, I think, of seeing how intelligent, feelingful people who are ready to be in touch with the language of a poem, um, will see some of the same things in the poem and identify the same places in the human heart <laughs> that a poem um, will touch. And so they, in some way, give us an explanation of why we need poetry without saying so explicitly. And at the same time, even as they, they, there's a consensus that will often form when there's a great poem before us, there are also all the variations of human feeling and human grief and uh, human hope that just one word, you know, I, I, I think of the word, the, the, this, this poem, uh, One Art, has the image of keys, lost keys. <laughs> what, do, what do lost keys mean to you and you and you? Sometimes to some people it means a minor annoyance. To other people it means I'm a complete mess. <laughs> That's the sign of deeper kinds of disorganization. To others, it's I can't even find my own door. And um, this is what poetic language at its best will do. And certainly when I'm, uh, you know, as fortunate as I've been to assemble this kind of all-star cast to read a poem, Elizabeth Bishop, um, you know, somewhere I hope uh, is approving. I'm sure she is. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the folks that you have talked with and encourage folks watching on Twitter and Facebook that if they have any questions 
or comments for Lisa New, who's the host of Poetry in America, just let us know and we'll get them to you. This is a question from someone online wondering which guest you were most excited to talk to uh, in this season of Poetry in America. Did anyone surprise you? Reminding folks that you have talked in past seasons to uh, Bono, Stuart Weitzman, yeah. late Senator John McCain, Anna Devere Smith. So you've got, it's, it's not like you're, you're hurting for folks to talk to, but did anyone surprise you in this upcoming season? Everybody, everybody surprises me. Um, that's again, uh, I don't mean for that to be a cop out. Um, the, that what does happen when someone who, you know, maybe this is a public person who's used to showing up on television all the time and talking about the state of the world or their next movie or this or that. When this person um, is rising in real time to the challenge of talking about a particular line of poetry, they surprise themselves, right? <laughs> they're not, they're, their handlers, their scripters, the people who give them talking points are not there for them. And so the inner person, so I, but John Kerry, um, Secretary John Kerry um, brought memories of his Vietnam experience um, in particular, and that, that, you know, made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, memories of the smell of fire. And not just the fires of destruction, the fires of napalm, which he does talk about in the poem, but the cook, the cook, I, this makes me cry when I almost cry when I think about it, the cook fires of the people in the villages um, so that one would smell people making breakfast and lunch and dinner. And the, the, that, that memory, that John Kerry shared with me brought the terrible poignancy and the suffering of veterans decades later into focus for me in a way that I'd certainly never heard before. And of course it came into focus because of the imagery of this poem, which, um, you know, the poem um, is a set of similes about really about fire and about- yes. So and to, to your earlier point too, it also becomes the keys, you know, to open up a door that some, uh, you know, other folks have not been able to access publicly uh, from Secretary, right. sorry, from that's Secretary right. Kerry. I want to talk to you uh, also about just so folks watching um, know that that when we talk about poetry, we're talking about a lot of types of expression of poetry, uh, and rap and hip hop uh, are, are definitely part of 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 this this tapestry, right? Absolutely. In in season one, we devoted uh, an episode to one of the greatest hip hop tracks ever, uh, New York State of Mind. And we focused on the poetic genius of hip hop artist Nas. Now, this is one of those areas, I have to be completely candid, where I do learn <laughs> from the guests. I, as a you know, academic scholar of poetry, I'm 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 catching up, uh, but I'm I'm not a hip hop expert. The but our yes, we the let me um, let me organize my thoughts and say, what has hip hop brought us? It's brought us an epic tapestry that um, tells the story of an underclass um, from, uh, from, and really in the best, uh, in, in the best hip hop tells a, a historical story of the progress of the people, uh, of a people and their um, balked dreams. It does that. It also formally brought back rhyme. <laughs> Who knew? When I, when I was a kid, rhyme was so passe, you know, nobody would write a rhyming poem. And now the joy, the bodily experience we have in reciting a poem that rhymes um, is part of every child's 
extracurricular education, whether or not they're studying it in school, they're listening to the radio and they're learning about, especially in hip hop, about very, very complex internal rhymes. Well, I, you know, what I love about rap and hip hop and listening um, uh, to it and my daughter listening to it is uh, the, the aggressive stance on using different syllables to be the rhyme rather yeah. than the sort of standard it's the last syllable that rhymes. And it doesn't have to be the last word that rhymes. It could be the word in the middle of the stanza that rhymes. And it's just so exciting to listen to, um, just to hear that that yeah. paradigm just blown op open and the creativity that's, just pouring over that's it. That's so. exactly what it is. And it's, you know, it's an oral medium. And so what are all of the resources? Not rhyme, yes, but also, alliteration and assonance and all of the and and rhythmic effects all of those tools that were in that are in the poetic toolbox and have been there for a very long time when a new um art form like hip-hop emerges the you know the old some of the old tools get polished up and there are um and there are new tools added to the box and now what we're seeing is um, poetry on the page is being influenced by by hip hop. I, l let me say in that connection that in the series we are what we want to do every season is at least spend one episode on poetry in performance, poetry that that lives live. Uh, and so in our first season, it was hip hop artist Nas we focused on. And in our second season, we went for something completely different, which was the lyrics of Stephen Sondheim. Um, and in both cases, there are debates. Is this poetry? Would we call would we call Broadway lyrics poetry? Would we call hip hop poetry? Um, it, I mean, I, I if, if I felt like having um, you know, picky in debates about those things. I probably wouldn't make a television series instead. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, be making a television series. I, I love to um, I showcase what can happen to rhymed verse when you add stagecraft, music, acting, an audience, and. In, in our Sondheim episode, which is already, even before we've aired, beginning to get a lot of attention, um, we have actors from the Broadway stage talking about what it's like to perform verse that is as carefully crafted as Sondheim's is. We're looking forward to that. I also wanted to, as we wrap up here, just folks watching at home, uh, some looking for some opportunities to uh, educate their kids and not so much in the standard way that they may be <laughs> afraid they have to, that over at the PBS Learning Media Center, uh, we've got a collection of, of stuff folks can use. It's uh, mass.pbslearningmedia.org. Uh, and of course, over at poetryinamerica.org, all of your episodes from last season are there and folks can start watching the new season here in Boston on GBH on Sunday, and it returns uh, across the country this month. Uh, Elisa, it has been such a great pleasure to chat with you today, uh, Living Room to Living Room, and I appreciate all the great work that you're doing on this, and I can't wait to, to watch more of the season of Poetry in America coming up. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Sue. It was a delight for me as well. All right, I'm Sue O'Call for WGBH. You've been watching us here on Facebook and Twitter for Lunch Hour Live. We'll be back, so keep it here, keep watching. Uh, stay safe, stay six feet away from each other because I'm watching you, so make sure that we take care of our social distancing. I like to call it physical distancing rather than social distancing, but let's just stay safe, and we're here for you, so we're gonna do as much content as we can uh, to keep you engaged and connected, and thanks for watching Lunch Hour Live. I'm Sue O'Connell.